Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And let's get started with the second and the final session of not only the Technology Day, but the whole virtual book launch. I am very honored to introduce our next moderator, Dr. Bruce Watson, who is chief scientist at IP Blocks and an expert in algorithms, innovation, and policy for AI. Dr. Watson, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I think most of you uh, have seen one of the panels that I've been uh, lucky enough to, to moderate in the past couple of years. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back again this time. And uh, of course, it's a shame that we're all distributed around the world. But nonetheless, I trust that all of the, uh, the remote participants will be able to get the maximum out of this. I would also, of course, very much like to thank the organizers, the fantastic team, uh, Marius in particular, who's been one of the key people pulling this together. And uh, it's very nice to uh, have a, a panel of the quality that I have the pleasure of moderating today as well. So let me move on to very quickly telling you something about the panel. Um, we have uh, the fusion, again, of two of what I find really to be the, the most exciting areas of information, computational, uh, and, and cyber issues um, globally. And these are namely artificial intelligence and things related to cryptography. So uh, we will be starting with two papers and two presentations on artificial intelligence. And we'll be closing off this panel session with uh, one paper on advances in cryptography, which I think uh, many of you will also find very interesting. And these things connect at a much deeper level and we hope to uh, bring that out during the discussion and some of the questions that we get. So as I introduce the, um, the speakers, I'm actually only going to introduce the first authors, but in all uh, of these cases, the, uh, the papers have been written with a, a small team of people. So I'll allow them to say something about the additional team members if they, if they choose. And the other thing is the format of the session will be such that we'll have each of the presentations. They're limited to something on the order of 10 or 12 minutes. And then we'll have an opportunity for some of the discussion uh, immediately. And of course, a larger chunk of time at the end of this for a discussion at the very end. So that means that uh, those of you listening worldwide, I would strongly encourage you to also already start to throw in your questions. Don't be shy and save up your questions for the very end. It would be very nice to develop that kind of interactivity as we go. So uh, to introduce the three uh, speakers that we have in this session, the first one, of course, is, uh, as you'll find in the book, Artur Lavrinov. And uh, he's uh, one of our staff members at CCDCOE, uh, which means that he's a very familiar face, I think, to many of us. Uh, he's going to be talking today about towards classifying devices on the Internet. So this is an artificial intelligence application for classifying devices uh, of various kinds. Um, he is a PhD candidate. Um, from his knowledge level, you, you wouldn't have guessed that. You would guess that uh, he's long past his PhD. He's uh, got miles of experience. Um, and uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, the additional things that he's doing as part of his career, obviously, at the University of Latvia. And he's currently, as I said, a research uh, researcher at CCDCOE focused on, on web and network technologies. So the next person that we're going to be having is another familiar face also at uh, SciCon for many years now, and that's Kim Hartman. Kim Hartman, uh, uh, the title of the, uh, the paper will be Hacking the AI. And uh, as you can tell, you know, this is uh, something that firmly fits with two of the things uh, in, in cybersecurity. Kim, for those of you that don't know Kim, uh, is Cyber and, uh, and IT Director at the Conflict Studies Research Center. Additionally, a senior consultant actually in many spheres. And Kim comes from a background of mathematics and computer science, which is, as we know, one of the, uh, the key ways of fusing knowledge in this area. Um, some of the work that Kim has been doing over the past years involves risk assessment of embedded systems, forensics, of course, one of the other hot topics, and secure development of software, which uh, I think, uh, given all of the, uh, the COVID tracing apps, is now an extremely hot topic for many uh, areas in the world. And then lastly, and, and certainly not least, we're going to be hearing from Ljubljana Beshai. And Ljubljana has attended uh, SciCon in the past, so if she looks familiar, that's why. Uh, this is her first time as a presenter, and uh, we, of course, hope this is the beginning of many uh, returns to SciCon in the future. Uh, she's going to be talking about recent developments in cryptography, and this is from the standpoint of her uh, position as a cyber fellow of mathematics. This is with the United States Army of Cyber, uh, sorry, Army Cyber Institute, and also at West Point, so a key academic connection as well. 
And Ljubljana comes from a mathematics and physics background, so very similar as well, and has an interest in cryptography of all kinds. And in particular, um, the one that uh, will get a bit of airtime today is, of course, post-quantum cryptography. Some people refer to it as, uh, as quantum-resilient cryptography. And uh, there are a couple of different possible algorithms for those of you in the know. And uh, one of her favorite areas is um, a, a class of algorithms called the isogeny-based uh, algorithms. So um, without further ado, also because I'm the least important person on this panel, let me move immediately to uh, switching over to Artu, who's going to present his work to us. And as a reminder, please uh, bring in those questions for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, this research is collaborative effort with Roman Graf and Kimo Heinaro, bringing in expertise from different fields. And we finished previous session uh, with discussing ICS, IoT, honeypots, and Shodan and malicious, non-malicious search engines. And this paper looks at this problem from, from different perspective, from observer perspective, and maybe this is something that we should be moving forward. And why does classifying devices matter? And we have new botnets. Every, every year we have new IoT botnets. If 10 years ago, if you said botnet, you hear Windows machines. Now, if you said botnet, it's probably some kind of embedded devices compromised, and these botnets are huge, hundreds of thousands of devices. And why they are created? Well, there are devices unprotected on the internet. Somebody find appropriate vulnerability and exploit it. Maybe as researchers, maybe as uh, observers, we could do some things preventatively. Maybe we should be looking on the internet for devices that are reachable, even if they are not compromised, not vulnerable, not uh, in any way abused. Well, reachability alone increases attack surface. And maybe if we can preventatively do something with it, next botnet will be smaller. And this is not a new thing. Scanning happening on, on huge, huge levels, and we saw that with ICS honeypots. And it has been happening almost since the beginning of the internet. And initially, it was fingerprinting uh, some services, some network stack impl implementations. But now it, trans it has transformed into scanning the internet-specific protocol, do protocol negotiations or banner grabbing, and this banner grabbing just means we request the device to send, that, send us their version, hardware, software, or some configuration keys. And there are non-malicious search engines uh, like Shodan and Census that allows anyone on the planet to look up already scanned different protocols. And these engines, as any tools, just use few hundred to few thousand static rules for example, checking if port is open and if specific protocol on that port replies with specific version of, of the device. And then we can make assumption, okay, if it replies with Siemens, then it's probably some kind of Siemens industrial control device. And it's, it's, it's working perfectly. It's very fast, it's very efficient, as long as, a, as at least single rule matches. If no rule match, then if we have one or few devices, we can investigate manually, maybe do some active probing if we are allowed to do it, of course, and maybe it will take an hour or a day or a week, and we get some result, maybe we get no result. Can we justify it for a um, set of million devices? Can we justify it investing million of man hours to, to classify a single set? Nobody can justify this, this expense. So, how the research has been progressing in this field. And the, the big problem is that every year there are more and more devices that are different. So all devices remain to some extent, but new and more heterogeneous devices come in. And it has been recognized by research community there are some, some approaches like automatically creating classification rules, but in general it's going towards two ways. Applying machine learning either to standard scan, they are exactly the same that Shodan has, 
uh, for the devices that are reachable to anyone or from observer perspective, but this is usually limited by university network because nobody wants to give access to researchers to observe like commercial network. Uh, it, it's too valuable and too, too risky. Uh, the problem is same as a very common machine learning problem. Nothing from, from this research can be reproduced easily. And we are actually looking how we can apply it in real life. And if we can't reproduce it easily, then we actually have to invest time to, to do it ourselves. So what has been done in this research? We concentrate on the reachable devices, meaning anyone can send specific packets over the internet and the device reply. Uh, what does it entail? We scan the internet for HTTP protocol, and this is not ICS protocol, this is just for web devices, but it is so generic, and it is the easiest and cheapest way how a manufacturer can implement uh, some kind of control panel. In last few years, there have been attempts to do it in a more mobile way, but still, this, this is the default way, and it will be the default way for many years to come. But the thing is, these responses are are very different. You can't like pick a single feature from the response and, and use that to classify or even few. So this research defines the device classes, how we acquire data sets, how we label it, how we investigate and select features, how we train network, and how we classify these sets. So the number one issue, we need to define classes of devices. And Every single piece of research has its own definition, and this is a big problem, and in the next few years it has to be addressed. We have to, we have to work with the same class sets, otherwise we can't compare our results. And the problem is when you define 100 classes, how many of them are actually different? And we, from our perspective, we do not see that they differ so much. We, we care about what is impact, who is impacted, either it's user or industrial, some kind of device, or what kind of data can be leaked, and stuff like that. So we propose very small sets. Smallest set we could come up with are 10 classes. And common web servers that are not that interesting from kind of device or IoT purpose. Uh, network devices that provide connectivity most commonly for residential connections. IoT, discussed ICS, infrastructure devices. Also, we put three old classes that were abused for, for wasting toner, wasting resources, stealing data feeds uh, for, for blackmail, for whatever purpose, stealing uh, phone communication resources. And we also introduce something that nobody else does, is that we see there are devices that can be categorized or are un completely unclear because the features are so sparse that expert could not classify it. We can't expect the machine learning classifier to classify something that expert can't classify because the data is just not sufficient enough. So what, what is our neural network? So it's, it's a very simple, and classical neural network, uh, we investigated features because you can't uh, really take just HTTP responses. You need to take some uh, some uh, some specific features, and that is that is addressed. We we have 2018, 2019 data sets for four data sets total. We label sufficient from our perspective uh, training set, and we use this data to to look at it. So what does this data show us? This data show us for standard ports that, as expected, uh, the web servers are, are prevalent. Maybe their websites, maybe their internal systems that are exposed unneededly, maybe something else, but that is something we as, as device researchers care the least for. And time-wise, there are no, no significant changes. Maybe we see that the printer class is, is very stable, maybe we see that phone and network devices are, are decreased in, in deployment, in wrong deployment, and all devices just from their old age expire. And uh, what we see at the alternative port is much more interesting. We see that, that web is not dominating anymore, that we see that alternative port contains much, much more kind of 
interfaces exposed to the internet. So if, if you want to target devices, maybe looking at alternative port is even more valuable than looking at the, the standard itself. And the most interesting part is that if we put all these four data sets together, if we put standard alternative port for every year, and we see that that significant difference in this web and non-web device, but we also see that we have huge number of uncategorized and clear devices. Unclear meaning the features are enough for human expert to say this is not a web server. This is something interesting, but it just does not provide us enough enough information to make decision what it is. And if you look at other research, then they are just classifying it somewhere. Uh, what we see is that proportionally, of course, the interesting devices are, are more common on, on the alternative ports and we should be looking there. So what, what, what are the results? The results are that we achieved 87% test accuracy, which is, which is amazing, uh, without, without the use of rule engine. Every, every single research that provides better test accuracy use some kind of rule engine or, or, or some other optimizations that that we want to min minimize. The interesting part about unclear and categorized, we expected to see it because we labeled the set. We expected it to see somewhat proportionally, but turns out that there are so many different devices that we actually, by randomly sampling the, uh, the initial data set for labeling, we miss them because they are so rare, so far apart. And the moment you, you train the network and you put it in, you see that we are unable to, to classify this device. And this is something that, that needs, needs more research. This is something that is observable over time, and it's much easier to, to address these issues in future just by, by, by monitoring, by just continuing it, and maybe some policy on some political level, maybe there is something comes up that IP cameras should be protected more just because they, they invade privacy too much. So for future, for future, we are looking at model with, with multiple protocols. We are looking for APIs that we can use ourselves and open to other developers. We are just looking at as much applied use as we can, and also we are investigating maybe explainable neural networks just to understand maybe we can, we can create the rule engine better just through understanding what neural network does itself. So that was the overview of the research. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Arthur. I'm sure uh, if we had the, uh, the full audience there today, you'd uh, be getting a very nice round of applause. Um, before we move on, which we will do in just a moment, um, I don't see a, a, a large stream of questions, but I would just like to pose one of the questions that I have uh, that arose in this, and maybe you can answer it briefly, or we can also save for the discussion later. Um, it's interesting that um, it, you, of course, have this initial group of, of 10 categories into which these were sorted. I'm curious to know your thoughts about um, whether it would be sensible to allow the categories to emerge from the data. So in, in the sense with a, a vast amount of data and of, depending on the kind of algorithm, the kind of neural network, you could allow it to, to learn and do categorization that maybe highlights that there are indeed 10 or perhaps 12 categories and perhaps even some subcategories. So perhaps your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, this, this is one of the concerns that we have, one of the ways to go forward. And we are going to definitely do that, but at the moment, we see a lot of issues, and the issues are that uh, if you look at the data, you can easily, even as expert, make wrong assumptions, and even machine will wrong assumption, makes wrong assumptions in the sense that there are embedded software vendors that provide software for every type of device. And just, uh, just that already caught us off guard, and if we did as that with, with the small feature, initial feature set that we had, we would have completely wrong, wrong impression. And we, we are following what other researchers are doing. And when they do that, something similar and, and produce results, and we see that, for example, magically Amazon has 
I don't know, 10,000 ICS devices. So what does it mean? Does it mean that uh, they are honeypots? Probably. Does it mean that neural network made wrong assumptions? Also, probably. We, we can't really know what's happening. So we are trying to maybe go into more, mm, more kind of expert rules and then look backwards from what neural network is actually trying to, to, to explain to us. Then, then maybe we can, we can go this route instead of just uh, going from bottom up. Indeed, indeed. And if I could uh, follow it up with a very short additional question, and that is I'm just interested um, to know whether you think this is something that might be weaponized. We, of course, are chronically dealing with asymmetric warfare in uh, the digital realm, cyberspace, and someone else able to then get a grip on what the possible devices out there are might uh, view this as very interesting research as well. Well, if, if there was uh, last session huge discussion about scanning who is malicious, who is not malicious, what is malicious even, and we are looking also at, at network traffic that we receive. We are interested what what is somebody poking. And we see every IP sees tens of thousands of requests every day. So it is already happening. But it is happening in a static way, the static rules. This is just a matter of time till somebody uses some, some model. Well, like unsophisticated attackers, they want simple solution and static rules are working for them. They get compromisable devices anyway, so until it is mitigated enough, they're not going to switch to, to some artificial intelligence. But the moment they switch, well, what we are trying to achieve is that somebody takes, takes action based on our data and maybe we can go to decision makers and saying, okay, we have model, we have trained, we see ICS devices that maybe is not seen by, by conventional means yet. Maybe you can address it somehow. Maybe we can do responsible disclosure and address it on, on a network level. At least block, block the access to them, even if you can't mitigate them on software level. Very true. Well, on that note, I think you've hit all of the uh, interesting points to make a segue to Kim's uh, talk, which is hacking the AI. And so uh, thank you again, Arthur. We'll come back in the later portion of the panel. And uh, Kim, let's uh, continue with you, please. Yes. Uh, hi, first of all. Thank, thank you for the introduction, Bruce. It's very nice to, to be with Saikon again this year. Um, I hope that you can hear me and everything as well and that you're all fine. So um, as you just said, I'm going to be talking about hacking the AI. And um, actually this is a paper I wrote together with Christoph Stoip, who at that time was um, at the Hochschule Saxony-Anhalt um, as an adjunct professor for artificial intelligence. He's now moved back to the Otto von Guericke University. And um, so this, it's a rather small team who wrote this paper. And basically what we did was uh, we sat together and realized that there are actually AI systems are being used in various applications, um, which is a trend that had evolved over the past couple of years. And we think it's a trend that's going to um, even establish itself further over the next decade. So um, Looking at the, the amount of application scenarios and especially the type of application scenarios where you have AI systems, um, we feel that there is not a decent discussion or not enough discussion going on regarding the security of AI systems. So considering only military applications, we are expecting to see AI penetrating into fields such as intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, uh, logistics, cyber operations, information operations, which is something we've actually seen quite a lot over the past year. Not so the most prominent example being deep fakes, which have been used um, quite extensively. There's actually another paper written by Kier Gals, myself, and Munira Mustafa, um, which has been published on, on that topic in case you're interested in that. Um, 
So it, we are also seeing that AI is being used in, in other uh, military applications, such as command and control or semi-autonomous and autonomous vehicles, as well as autonomous weapon systems. So there is actually indeed um, evidence around that there is already an AI, AI arms race going on. And um, it's something that we need to consider whenever we include AI in our systems. So additionally to the previously named military applications, there is actually a, quite a lot of civilian applications which are even being used or utilized even more incautiously, um, simply because most civilian applications don't have this hard security scanning for uh, their applications prior to being deployed. So um, we are looking at public security surveillance, financial markets, healthcare applications, HCI, HMI, civilian cybersecurity, power grid manage management, many other things, especially when you move into the whole autonomous computing um, area. So these are just the, the most prominent examples. And any of these application scenarios are of high value to civilian governmental and military units and have to be therefore also to be considered as of high re relevance to our modern societies. So however, th this is also what makes these systems as a particularly valuable assets to cyber criminals, malicious cyber actors, or generally within cyber warfare. And we just felt that um, given this fact, it's not being considered adequately, or the discussion is not enough. So this was one of our aims actually to foster this discussion. So despite this, the security of AI systems is underrepresented, in the, especially in the public discussion, but even also among decision makers. Um, so. Although there have been reports on successful attacks against AI within academia, which have emerged over the past couple of years, we believe that this is really a new trend. So we are going to see more of these types of attacks over the next decade. And the utilized attack vectors range from such attacks that require little to no technical knowledge to such that require highly sophisticated um, attack vectors, which are directed against the underlying AI system or that use large some mathematical models. So there are actually examples of, um, for example, clothing that is being used to, to uh, allow an individual to become undetectable to AI um, supported public surveillance systems. So some of the reported results from such attack vectors are apart from, from being becoming un, undetectable to the AI for an individual, um, there have also been um, examples of an AI mistaking a, a turtle for a rifle. So obviously, if you base your decision on, on that mistake, you can imagine the consequences this may have. So the penetration of AI throughout digital spaces is likely to increase even further over the next decade, as well as our reliance on its correct identification and reasoning. So this is one of the big issues that I see with um, AI support in any technical system is that humans have the tendency to believe that whatever decision a system, a technical system comes up with has to be absolutely true because it's considered to be absolutely technical and true, based on, on logical reasoning and nothing else. But the complexity with AI systems is that the underlying you know, the underlying um, performance of the AI is actually based on, on different mathematical models and is often hidden in within the layers. So it's, it's something that is not absolutely transparent to how the AI actually made its decision. And it is actually envisioned that AI will outperform humans in most tasks involving the processing of large data and information, high precision or complex reasoning over the next couple of years. Well, not exactly the next years, but the next decade. And it's actually something, it's a trend we've already seen in, in a couple of fields. So um, we are relying too much on AI reasoning without questioning how the decision was being made. So. Given the wide range of applications involving AI, is, which is startling, um, it, it is actually very interesting that AI has got to this position because it, is, uh, it has been prominently noted that AI has been regarded as being almost impossible secure, to secure. So in December 2019, uh, Microsoft published a series of materials on the topic where Marilicia McLean stated that, in short, there is no common terminology today to discuss security threats. 
um, to those systems and methods to mitigate them. And we hope that these new materials will pro uh, provide baseline language. So we're actually talking about that we are, we are at the level where we utilize a technology to an extent in our applications, uh, which is really startling. Um, and at the same time, we have not, we don't even have the baseline language to discuss security issues within those systems. So this is something that we really need to think about. And um, over the past decade, we have, witnessed, we have witnessed the increasing and incautious utilization of AI and ML techniques in various applications uh, we, whose correct functioning is absolutely crucial to our modern societies. So it is easily imaginable how malfunctioning of these systems may have a devastating impact on civilian lives, as well as our financial markets, national security, or even military operations. So with an increasing dependence of society on ML and AI, we must prepare for the next generation of cyber attacks being directed against these. So attacking the system through its learning and automation methods allows the attacker to severely damage the system by altering its learning outcome, its decision-making, identification, or final output. Furthermore, AI systems are difficult to analyze post-incident as well as in integrating real-time monitoring during the operation. As I said, much of the learning and reasoning are done in what is called a hidden layer, and in its essence, that is basically corresponding to a black box model. Therefore, the discrimination of a compromised from an uncompromised AI system in, in real time is considered to be very difficult. We're not even talking about mitigation strategies. We're actually talking about identification, which is something rather considered more or less doable for normal technical systems, but for AI systems, we we are not at that level yet. So with its increasing utilization in crucial application scenarios, securing AI system becomes of utmost importance, and we have to think of ways of doing this. However, apart from wanting to secure our AI systems, we have found that knowing a knowledge of AI systems vulnerabilities will also be of high importance to, to defensive operations. So for an example, during 2019, um, we have witnessed uh, an increase in weaponization of AI, which has been extensively used to create deep fakes, which are found to impose a sincere threat to our democracies worldwide. So breaking things down, deep fakes are the AI supported alteration or generation of media, which may then be spread through various platforms. The uprising of DeepFace has encouraged the U.S. DARPA to spend $68 million on the sole identification of DeepFace. So while it is of utmost importance to actually identify the, uh, uh, the AI support disinformation campaigns, the mere identification will not stop the operation. What is needed is, is knowledge of how to actually actively stop AI supported attacks. And this knowledge will become essential to operators and decision makers to establish and uphold cyber power over the next decade. So what we did within the paper was to give a brief introduction to selected AI and ML methods, um, which are currently being used in prominent in, prominent, uh, in various application scenarios. And uh, we reported on the state of art uh, of attack patterns directed against these. Um, so while attacks against the underly underlying AI have not been prominently discussed, over the last decade, it must be expected that these systems will be prominent targets throughout the 2020s. And in order to discuss and evaluate AI systems, we need methods to describe the structure, their structure and coping potential. And uh, within the paper, we have uh, derived and discussed uh, an attack surface model for the selected types of AI systems and their underlying models and technical structure. We have also analyzed the implications of AI and ML attacks for the next generation of cyber conflicts, and we discuss uh, some of the more recent attempts to mitigation strat strategies. So what is so particular about AI systems is the combination of being inherently covered. So if you have an attack directed against an AI, it's inherently covered because you won't be able to see it live. You, you're not seeing that your system is malfunctioning, your system is perfectly working. Um, it's it's just not reasoning in the way it should. And the, the combination of being inherently covered and its devastating impact on society and the wide unawares of AI and ML vulnerabilities make these attack vectors uh, highly favorable for malicious cyber operations. 
So such attacks have already been witnessed and are being discussed in technical and academic communities, but have not reached the public space, nor are application developers aware of the risk of the utilization of AI. So that's another issue to really consider, is that application developers need to be more aware when they use AI methods in their systems or in the, in the systems or components that they are developing, that they are actually considering to, to that they are actually taking into consideration the, the measures that they have to secure these, these components. So, and despite our analysis, it remained difficult to provide a vulnerability hierarchy for the AI methods that we investigated as um, the attack surface models as such is generally based on identifying attack vectors which are based on entry and, ex entry and exit points into the system. Um, however, the impact of such an attack vector may vary greatly with the data assets that are being targeted. So the specific method utilized or the application scenario is also having a strong impact on the, the actual value of the attack vector. And that's something that we we or generally that is not considered in the attack um, surface modeling. Um, well, not, at least not at this stage. It's something that, that needs to be done in the near future to actually assess the security of AI systems. Um, so we had some findings. I would like to um, refer you to the paper. Um, we had some findings for CNN scans, uh, ANNs, and SVMs, and we actually had, did manage to establish a, what I would call a weak hierarchy regarding the utilization of these um, of these four uh, AI and ML methods. Uh, but as I was said, it's, that's a rather weak hierarchy. It's a preliminary result. Um, it's work in progress that needs to, to be done further. Um, but at least there, it's, it's, a, it's a starting point. So I would like to refer you to the paper to, to get more information on that. Um, and defining the attack surface of AI systems has provided information that needs further inf information to derive the application-specific risk. So uh, currently only a few reports exist on attack surface metrics, um, which, is, which are not specific enough to AI systems. So um, we have seen that these systems cannot be analyzed by solely investigating the attack surfaces, but the internal processing, processing disclosing, discloses particular weaknesses that are a result of data assets and the methods characteristics and processes. So in order to enhance the security of AI systems, a common language to discuss the vulnerability of such systems must be installed. And furthermore, methods to reliably quantify the susceptibility to cyber attacks must be developed. Policy considerations being derived by the AI community show that the need to harden AI systems against manipulations and attacks are acknowledged within the academic communities, but they have to be more prominently discussed by the public and by decision makers as well. My goal with this talk and with the paper in general is to foster an understanding of the susceptibility of AI systems to cyber attacks, how the incautious utilization of AI and ML may make our societies more vulnerable, as well as the, knowledge, the value of knowledge of the peculiar vulnerabilities of such systems and defensive operation, operations within the ongoing AI arms race. As a conclusion, it must be noted that AI systems are indeed susceptible to cyber attacks and that the utilization of AI methods increases any application's vulnerability. And I'm, I, I'm happy to rephrase or to restate that. I'm absolutely sure at this point, if you use AI within your system without considering its, con its security impact on your overall software component or your overall device, you are increasing your application's vulnerability. And this is something that is, has, cannot be rephrased enough in order to, to actually make the point. And it really urges for a more sensitive use of AI and ML methods and security and safety sensitive ap applications. So given the anticipated of Utico's utilization of AI and ML in applications over the next decade, the already existing diversity of attack vectors and the current inferiority of our countermeasures is really alarming. And the defense of AI systems is yet at its beginning and urges for further investigations of the specific vulnerabilities of these systems. So in the context of the political challenges and the ongoing AI arms race, a profound knowledge of AI systems vulnerabilities must be established to uphold cyber sovereignty. So that is my concluding 
statement on the topic. I hope that you are all intrigued now to actually read the paper because there, the technical stuff is in the paper. I'm very sorry that it did not fit within the 10 minutes I was supposed to speak, but um, I hope you liked it. So thank you for listening and I'm glad to be here. Thanks very much, Kim. <laughs> a very big round of applause as well from uh, all And it was a pleasure to hear a comprehensive treatment of this, or at least as comprehensive as uh, we could fit into the time allowed and a tiny bit more than the time allowed. So I, I, I really encourage people with questions out there to stream them to us. Uh, before we continue with um, our last speaker, I would, however, just like to very quickly ask you something, Kim. And, um, and that is to, to just, you know, get your opinion on one of the things that relates to AI security that you didn't explicitly mention, but, um, you know, we have previously briefly talked about, and that is the possible vulnerability through uh, training data in the beginning. So, of course, I, I very much agree that the, the biggest attack surface is AI systems once they're in play and installed and part of larger decision-making processes. Um, once and hopefully if we uh, manage to solve that, uh, we will um, then face the potential problem that someone can pollute the training data in the first place. And that might be a more insidious place to, uh, to subvert or, or hijack the AI. Do you have uh, perhaps a quick thought on that? And um, connecting back to your uh, talk as well. So, um, first of all, yes, thank you very much for reminding me of that point. It's actually um, a big point in, in the paper. Um, so, looking at AI systems, you have different types of systems. So, you, either, you can have a system where you actually have um, the AI being trained with data before it, being, before it is actually deployed. But you can also have um, an AI system where the, uh, the training is actually being performed while the system is also uh, already being in operation. Um, so, of course, if you have um, data being manipulated during the training, that will, of course, affect the decision making. And it's something that is very hard to detect unless you have methods installed that uh, verify that the data you are feeding into your AI are not being, uh, being manipulated. Um, which is something that is not done generally uh, currently. And it's, uh, it's actually a problem that gets even worse when you look at systems that are being trained um, while in operation, because during that, that it really comes into technical challenges, because you will have problems with, attack, with identifying this attack vector while it is being done um, and keeping the system running. So it's, it's, it's a big challenge for systems that are working on, pre, that are being pre-trained -trained and then operated, but it's um, a really big problem, a really big issue for those systems which are training through, during operation. Indeed, indeed. Okay, I, I think we could talk uh, much longer about this, and I would encourage people to get their questions in. And failing that, of course, don't forget that our speakers are the kinds of people who will engage you uh, by email if you do have questions that you didn't remember to get in. So uh, without further delay, let me please move on to our last speaker, um, who's not talking about AI, but a lot of the, uh, the cryptographic primitives, including cryptographic primitives relating to post-quantum cryptography, uh, actually have a role to play in the security of many kinds of systems either via um, obfuscation and normal cryptography or via signatures. And so uh, it's with, uh, with pleasure that I introduce you now to Ljubljana, who's going to tell us about recent developments in cryptography. Please, Ljubljana. Thank you, Bruce. So this is the joint work with uh, Colonel Andrew Hall, which is uh, the director of uh, Army Cyber Institute. So next slide, please. Next. So I'll start with uh, some motivation. Why uh, are we interested in looking at uh, post-quantum cryptography? So as uh, a lot of you might know, quantum computers are exciting, I would say, and also powerful machines that will take a new approach to processing information and may lead to revolutionary breakthroughs in a variety of fields, such as material science, drug discovery, optimization of complex man-made systems, and artificial intelligence. But uh, for people like me who work in cryptography, they actually pose a threat because, as a lot of you might know, uh, there is a short algorithm. Uh, so Peter Shore, in 1994, he wrote a paper which basically described how quantum... Next slide, please. 
how quantum uh, computers can uh, break uh, the discrete law problem, which is basically the underlying problem in uh, the public key crypto systems that uh, we use nowadays. So this is, uh, this is quite a big uh, threat for uh, cryptographic purposes because uh, this uh, algorithm can actually solve the discrete law problem in uh, exponentially faster than uh, any other algorithm that is uh, known nowadays. So basically, public key cryptography in a quantum world, will, public key cryptography as we know nowadays, will be not valuable. So we cannot use it anymore. And so this is for public key. Now, one other question that people might ask is, okay, do quantum computers pose a threat uh, to private uh, key or symmetric key cryptography? Next slide, please. And um, the answer to that is also yes. So Grover's, uh, there is another algorithm which uh, can be implemented in quantum computers, which is known as uh, Grover's algorithm, which uh, this algorithm, uh, makes a quadratic speed up in uh, solving uh, uh, problems that uh, will break symmetric key cryptography. But uh, the good news for symmetric key cryptography is that uh, Grover's algorithm just poses a quadratic speed up not an exponential one. So that means that by we can still use the same type of crypto systems and uh, we will have the same security that we have nowadays by just increasing the uh, key size. So basically, we can still use these uh, crypto systems, just increase uh, the key sizes. Next slide, please. So in 2015, NSA uh, made an announcement that uh, we should uh, start uh, preparing for uh, the quantum era and uh, come up with a new type of uh, crypto systems that will be resistant to quantum uh, uh, computers. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, NIST, in 2016, they announced a competition that uh, required the people to submit uh, they uh, to submit uh, quantum resistant crypto systems so this has been uh, next slide please this process has been uh, going on since 2016 and uh, now we are in what is called uh, the round 3 uh, of uh, this uh, uh, round three of this process, basically, which uh, what that means is that a lot of, uh, in the first stage, there was submitted uh, 69 algorithms, mostly for uh, key exchange. Uh, these algorithms are obviously for public key crypto, uh, crypto systems and mostly for key exchange and digital signatures. And uh, from the 69 that were submitted in the first stage, now we have uh, 26 crypto systems. 19 of them are for uh, public key, uh, for key exchange and seven of them for uh, digital signatures and uh, NIST, the people who work at NIST, they believe that uh, this uh, stage will take uh, up to 2021 and then they will decide in one or two type of uh, crypto systems that uh, will be used uh, in a post-quantum post world. Next slide, please. So these type of uh, crypto systems are uh, the mathematical problems that these type of crypto systems are based are uh, split into five categories. One of them is code based and these categories are called code based cryptography, multivariate cryptography, lattice based, hash based and uh, the fifth but not uh, uh, Last, it's uh, isogeny-based cryptography. So these uh, type of uh, crypto, uh, these uh, categories have advantages and disadvantages. They vary in uh, performance measurements and also in maturity. So some of these uh, schemes are considered well understood, and there is a general agreement on the required security parameters, but some of them are not uh, as well understood. They are more recent, and uh, the exact security that they provide is still under investigation. And uh, one of these schemes that is uh, considered as uh, more recent, and uh, it's still under a lot of investigation, is the fifth category, which is isogeny-based category. So this category is basically based on elliptic curves. So people who worked uh, in elliptic curve cryptography, they, uh, when we started talking about uh, post-quantum crypto systems, one natural question to ask was, okay, can we leverage elliptic curves into 
Can we somehow leverage them and coming up with some type of crypto system that will be resistant to quantum computers? And the answer is yes. And the good news about these uh, new crypto systems that are based on elliptic curves is that uh, in a similar way as classical elliptic curve cryptography, which provides very short keys compared to any other type of crypto systems, these post-quantum uh, cryptography crypto systems also provide very short keys uh, compared to all other types of crypto systems. But again, keep in mind that, as I said previously, these are considered as um, new schemes and a lot of people are very skeptical, so there is still a lot of work being done in this uh, area. Next slide, please. So this is also my area of research. Uh, I uh, come from a background, uh, a mathematical background in uh, algebraic curves. And uh, what are algebraic curves? Basically, algebraic curves are just, uh, they are, uh, we can think about them as uh, the solutions to the equations that uh, we see in the slide there. This uh, that I denote with E, which is y squared is equal to x cubed plus ax plus b. This is one of the, uh, the simplest example of an algebraic curve, which we call it an elliptic curve. So what we do is once we have an equation like this, y squared is equal to a cubic, then we look at the solutions of this uh, equation, of this polynomial, basically, and all the points that satisfy this polynomial, we put them in the set, and then we define some addition that we can uh, explain geometrically very nicely for elliptic curves, and uh, they form what is called a group. Next slide, please. And so now uh, to do to leverage elliptic curves uh, for uh, post quantum cryptography, what we do is we look at uh, different type of elliptic curves, so different polynomial equations, and uh, we look at some maps that go between these polynomials. And these maps we call them isogeny maps. And for elliptic curves, this, we know how to do this. We know how, starting from one elliptic curve, we know how to go to another elliptic curve using these isogenies. Of course, these are considered very difficult problems to figure out uh, these isogenies, but uh, this is known how to, how to be done for the case of elliptic curves. Next slide, please. So now the interesting part or what we do is uh, we start with one elliptic curve and then we use these maps that we call isogenies and we get another elliptic curve. And then we use the same map and we get other elliptic curves. And so this way we get uh, this graph, which we call them expander graphs. And uh, they, ex they are called expander graphs from the name. Also, they expand very quickly. And so to do... Uh, the, uh, next slide, please. So basically, here is a very simple example of an expander graph. We start with one elliptic curve. Uh, we can characterize elliptic curves by this number. So 93 is one elliptic curve. And then we the, uh, the edges here are the isogenies between these elliptic curves. And so we get uh, these expander graphs. And we use them to uh, determine uh, Diffie-Elman key exchange uh, using these graphs. Next slide, please. So how is it done? If uh, you have seen Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange in the past, this is very similar to Diffie-Hellman key exchange as it's done for uh, elliptic curves or also RSA. The only difference is that uh, now the main function here is now it's uh, this the way that we exchange the keys is by getting some paths in this isogeny graph, which is very big. Next slide, please. But elliptic curves, elliptic curves, they are very, very cool, but they have, uh, they have some drawbacks in uh, performance. And so when, uh, when we have this problem that elliptic curves uh, have some drawbacks, for people who work in algebraic curves, the, the next, uh, the most natural question to ask is, okay, can we somehow use uh, curves with higher degree, which we call them hyperelliptic curves, to, to uh, solve these uh, drawbacks? And uh, the answer to that is uh, yes, we can actually use uh, higher degree curves to solve these drawbacks. Next slide, please. So let's... Um, 
real quickly here, I will say that the hyperelliptic curve is uh, a curve that is given by this uh, polynomial equation, y squared is equal to, now if you look at the right hand side of this polynomial, we don't have a degree 3 anymore, but we have a degree 6. So these curves are more complex uh, curves than elliptic curves, but the nice thing is that these complex curves can be split up into elliptic curves. So what we do is we start with one uh, hyperelliptic curve and then we can split it up into many other uh, elliptic curves uh, by using these isogeny maps. And the idea is that when we look at uh, elliptic curves, we have one isogeny between these maps. When we, have, uh, when we look at hyperelliptic curves, let's say in one case uh, we say the hyperelliptic curve splits in two, two isogenies, then we have 15 more elliptic curves here. And so what we did in this paper is we looked at hyperelliptic curve and we looked at a specific class of how they split into this category. And what we're interested is in looking how many isogenies do they actually split and uh, is this, uh, is, uh, will this be uh, much better for uh, much faster to leverage this uh, type of uh, curves basically for uh, isogeny based cryptography so okay i see my time is over i can uh, go talk more about this i went a little bit uh, briefly but uh, i think i'll stop here since we have just five more minutes <laughs> Thank, thanks so much, Luviana. I, it would uh, be a pleasure also to continue listening to uh, to all of these topics. So, uh, no question about that. Um, maybe uh, we can very briefly see um, if there are questions coming from the outside um, that uh, that need to be addressed. Um, and uh, just um, before we go to that, I can also throw in one of my own questions related to um, post-quantum cryptography, uh, and that is, um, you know, as as we've talked before, Ljubljana, about the um, uh, the notion of signatures that are based on many of the same cryptographic principles. And uh, signatures are, are then used all over the place. They also have uh, potential use in the security of, of AI systems, um, where it would be nice to sign them and make sure that they're not tamper-proof. Uh, do you have a feel for, uh, and I say this specifically to you, Ljubljana, do you have a feel for um, how long it will take before we have adequate uh, signature-based systems um, from any one of the, um, the possible outcomes of the NIST competition, uh, or perhaps something coming in uh, completely from the outside? So the best uh, scenario would be, I would say, uh, maybe 7 to 17 years. So I'm saying this, basically it will take NIST at least two more years to come up with uh, what they think that is uh, the best, not is, I should say are, because they have uh, announced that they have made the announcement that they will uh, choose more than one crypto system. So it will take them at least uh, two more years to come up with that. And then in the past years, uh, to deploy to new type of crypto system, it has taken five to 15 years. Of course, these uh, crypto systems, these new methods, they're all much more complex than anything uh, else that we've done so far. So my feeling is that uh, even though in the past it had taken five to 15 years, I think that it will take much more for this. But how much longer, I'm not uh, exactly sure. But uh, at least I, I am, uh, yeah. That's probably the million dollar question, of course. And uh, we should also be realistic that many of these are, um, are are based on, as you say, very difficult mathematical problems. And the key is to, to find one that's either provably difficult uh, or we have confidence that because no one else has found a solution, for example, in factorization, that uh, it's therefore believed to be difficult on either cl uh, classical or quantum computing. Um, maybe we can very quickly then um, also take that to uh, to Kim. Um, you know, whether or not signatures are then at all a viable uh, way of plugging some of the holes, uh, as you say, in the hackability of AI. And classical signatures would be easy to do, but uh, with the looming quantum threat, we, uh, we now know that that's not going to be enough. So, of course, the question is, what do you want to, 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 to sign? So, um, 
of course, if you, if you were able to to sign the system which is being operated, so so the problem with AI is actually that the, the AI system being operated will always have some changes. So it it will always alter in a way um, because that's that's base. It's now it's it's not going to change. It sh it shouldn't change the way it is making decisions. So the the basic concepts that is that are being used should remain the same throughout the operation but of course no it doesn't always have to apply there there, there are systems which are actually adaptable systems so they adapt to um, whatever um, surrounding they are being put into so with those systems you probably won't be happy with signing the model or or the base system that you that you developed um, but of course if you are now looking at at an at a system that is actually being used in a more classical way of AI, so you have your, your pre uh, you have your data which you use for pre-training, and then you move on to operation. Um, that may be a good idea to sign that type of system. But as you as you see from my answer, you really have to look at what 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 system are we looking at and what methods are you using. So it will be um, so the answer will be it depends, as often within IT security. <laughs> I, I think that's a, a very good point for us to, uh, to to end the discussion, not because we are at the end of the discussion, but because uh, we have uh, no time available for a very nice continuation of that. So I would encourage any of you interested to rather uh, take this to email with uh, any of the panelists and with me as well. And uh, on that note, I hand it back to our host with uh, thanks very much to all of the panelists from me. Thank you to our moderator, Dr. Bruce Watson, and to the panelists for this uh, highly specialized and very interesting session to round off the Tech Day, not only the Tech Day, but all the entire virtual book launch of this year's Saigon Proceedings. Also, a warm thank you for the audience for tuning in and uh, joining the sessions. Thank you. Warm thanks on my behalf as well. Before we sign off, we would like to give the word to the NATO CCD COE director, Colonel Yak Darian, for his closing remarks. Please, Yak, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Henrik. What a wonderful job of hosting during these three nights from here in Tallinn. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Psycon fans, uh, the 2020 book has been launched. Uh, thanks to our world-class authors, thanks to the expert moderators. The articles will be available on our website. Uh, all three days will be reviewable on our YouTube channel. If you want a hard copy, it comes off the print in uh, two or three weeks' time. Check our website for details if you want a hard copy. Well, now, uh, we really wanted to have this as a conference. We were even considering having a virtual conference, but we quickly scrapped the idea. Why? SciCon is a different conference. While I agree many conferences in the world can be done in a virtual format. This is almost the same way as in person. SciCon has that special vibe. You all know that. It, it cannot be defined. Is it the icebreaker? Is it the midnight talent city streets? I don't know, but it's, it's there. And no matter what your bandwidth, SciCon vibe doesn't travel in a digital format. It's just there. So we're hoping that the sharpest mind in the world medicine will defeat the COVID-19 pandemic that next year, during the same week, we can meet here in Tallinn, in person, just like we did last year and 11 years before that. There is one more thing. What's the theme? Drum roll. The Psycon 2021 theme is, we are going viral. Where did we get that one from? You can take a wild guess. I'm not going to help you out. We're going to... Uh, issue the call for papers pretty soon, so uh, world-class authors, please enlighten us next year how we're going viral. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank the wonderful team of CCD COE for hosting this event. Uh, the audio video team, RGB, you guys are expensive, but you're worth it. Thanks for doing it once, once again. Uh, and hope to Really, really see you here in Tallinn, in person, same week in May 2021. Thank you. Over and out. <laughs>